Live to tape and in studio. Go team. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Overrun Podcast. My name is Ed Bowder. I'm Dan Schwester. And we are going to do our uh, our year end show today, the end of <laughs> the end of 2023. Would certainly been a, a fascinating year, for, interesting for medicine and EMS overall. Um, we got a couple of papers we're going to talk about today, and then we're going to talk about some uh, some news stories that have kind of uh, either directly or tangentially involved EMS. Yeah. And then we got uh, we got another what the actual at the end of it to kind of wrap up the year. Um, the, the, what the actual it's a doozy. It's, it's, it's a good one. It's a good one. So let, let's get right into some of the data, right? So it's the end of 2023, and a couple of papers have come out. Um, one of specifically was talking about how nitroglycerin works in acute pulmonary edema, congestive yeah. heart failure. Um, this was done by Patrick et al., and they put out a paper in 2020 where they talked about the initial feasibility of this type of treatment. So right. they had a, an N of about 48 people. Kind not of a like, big, kind of, not a big sample not, size. Not big, not great, but I mean, it's one of those like you got to start somewhere, right? Kind of thing. And I, I think to an extent, we've all kind of known anecdotally that giving nitroglycerin in pulmonary edema and in, in CHF is going to improve the outcome. I think it's well established, but it's all, again, it's all anecdotal evidence. No one right. ever really studied it because nitroglycerin has been around forever. Who's, who's going to study it? So nit nitroglycerin is actually one of my, one of my favorite backstories. It's, uh, I've, I've talked about the discovery of it uh, okay. a lot during talks um, because I, I think it's fascinating. I, I actually, I watched Oppenheimer the okay. other day. Yeah. And uh, one of the things they mentioned were like, oh, well, you know, you're looking to be the next Alfred Nobel. And he's like, Nobel invented dynamite. <laughs> like, <that's, laughs> but it, the, and again, if one of those things are like, if it's not published, it doesn't mean that it's not true necessarily. Yeah. Right? And I think we fall into that trap of now, especially with the evidence-based medicine buzzwords and everything. Yeah. Like if there's not a study behind it, it doesn't exist. Not necessarily. True. Right. So, yeah. So Patrick came out with it and his team came out with this paper in 2020. It's in pre-hospital emergency care. Um, it's N of 48. They were looking at what giving intravenous nitroglycerin would do for these patients in acute pulmonary edema and congestive heart failure. Big picture stuff. They found out that it decreased uh, median systolic blood pressure from 211 to 175, uh, five minutes after giving the nitroglycerin. Cause you know, you take the blood pressure, you give the nitro, you take, take the blood right. pressure. Um, but it stayed around 181 upon ED arrival. So I, that kind of suggests that giving just the, the one dose of nitroglycerin can temporize their blood pressure until you get to the hospital. Decreased the average pulse rate from 113 to 103. It increased SpO2 from 86 to 98. Now, again, we don't necessarily want SATs to get up to 100 because we don't know if it's 100 or 102 or 103 or, or, five, or, five, or five. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I'm fine with 98. And then 90% of these CHF patients were identified by paramedics, which is something that, we, like, we know, again, that we're, we, we know how to identify CHF. Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty established. Paramedics are pretty good at picking yeah. this out. Yeah, Especially so we, those real classic textbook cases. Yeah, yeah. so we're, we're, we're really good at figuring out, like, all right, this is a pulmonary edema case. This is what's going on with the patient. Mm -hmm. You know, you listen to Rawls or whatever. And, it, you know, if you're ever not sure if it's Rawls or Ronchi, a lot of times the blood pressure can kind of lead you in that direction. Right. Like, you know, you're listening to someone who's got pneumonia and you're like, oh, I'm not sure. They got a little bit of everything. Right. Like, is that, is that Rawls, Ronchi? And then, you know, if their pressure is 110 over 60, ah, it's probably wrong. Right? It's probably wrong. So we're, we're pretty good at identifying this, but then what they found out in the study was we give these aliquot doses of nitroglycerin um, intravenously instead of sublingually, it's reducing all these blood pressures, it's increasing oxygenation, which is the point, right? right. So this paper comes out in 2020. Um, it's a really good paper. The link is in the, uh, the show notes. And then uh, it was followed up in JSEP Open, <clears throat> where the same team, uh, Patrick and his team, talked about the safety of pre-hospital intravenous bolus dose nitroglycerin in patients with acute pulmonary edema. Essentially, it was just a four-year follow-up. Mm -hmm. So instead of 48 patients, now we've got 235 patients, which is a much better and better, better sample size. Right. We, and, and we didn't, we haven't gone through the, you know, they, we didn't go through like, uh, you know, regression analyses or anything like that. Like we, I, I don't, I'm not really sure what the number needed to treat would be for it to really be a, a big difference, which is something that's a fair question. I, I'm sure is going to come up on, you know, on, Ken Milne's show where he'll talk about this actual study in much more depth. Um, 
But again, same, similar results, decreased systolic blood pressure uh, from 198 to 168, decreased pulse from 108 to 103, increased SpO2 up to 98 once again. And again, the conclusion was this suggests a favorable profile for IV nitroglycerin. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just to take it down to the basics, your, your, your patient's blood pressure is going down, which is good. That's reduced preload, reduced afterload, which is good for CHF patients. Right but it's not crashing them. Um, yeah. Their pulse rate is going down too. Not again, not drastically enough that it's going to cause a problem, but that heart's working less hard. Yeah. It's, it's definitely not plugging away, trying to get the, you know, struggling against the tide, so to speak. And the big thing here is the, the, the really impressed me was the SPO2 goes up. That, I think it's the best part of the paper. I, I think it's, I think it's fantastic that we see that we're getting nitroglycerin and, all of a sudden, this this patient's breathing better. Right, they're breathing more effectively. So, what does this mean downstream? This is a patient that maybe doesn't go to the ICU, that maybe goes to the floor, that doesn't go to BiPAP or CPAP, mm -hmm. or you know has to deal with that, and maybe just a venti mask or something like that. These are these are salvageable people that we can make a real in, a real positive influence on really early in their care. And I think we talk in the field a lot about you know, what kind of tangible improvements can we make to patients, right? Yeah, this and is it, one it's, of them. It's difficult in the field because we, we very, we so infrequently see the outcomes of our treatments, right? Like right. usually when we hear a, from a patient or from a family, it's a, it's in the form of a complaint. <laughs> um, you know, I, like we, we gave IV nitroglycerin, but the IV hurt. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it, it's, it's cool to see that there are actual like good quantifiable outcomes that, that we can, we can help facilitate. What I like about this in, in giving IV nitroglycerin is, and again, you've seen one paper, you've seen one paper. I, I think that the preponderance of data is starting to suggest that maybe giving IV nitroglycerin is just fine. And I also start to, I, I think it makes a lot more sense now because we've, over the past four or five years, everybody is being put on CPAP. And right. something that at least I've noticed anecdotally is there's a lot of people taking the mask off to like throw a nitro tablet in there or to give them a little bit of spray. Yeah. And it feels like in this type of setting, we don't have to do that anymore. And like, aside from the advantages of not improperly giving a medication, <laughs> you know, it's, it's also, there's, there's things that we do for our convenience and, you know, unstrapping a CPAP mask from someone aside from breaking the seal, maybe decreasing the oxygen delivery. You have no way to control how much of that nitroglycerin they actually absorb any of that. When you've got someone on CPAP, you can now give them, you know, whatever, a 50 ml or 50 mic aliquot of nitroglycerin, knock the pressure down a little bit. You know how much you gave, you know how quickly you gave it. You know, I didn't even go, it's, it's I didn't more even go further. Thing. I mean, you know, if you think about it, we're, you know, we've always been, let's go back to the old standard of sublingual nitro. 0.4 milligrams, 400 micrograms sublingually every five minutes. That translates out. If you divide it simply, it's an 80 microgram per minute dose. Right. However, you got to remember that for the sublingual dose, you're only getting half of that. It's about 40% bio, bioavailable. So you're really not getting all the nitro into them that you think that, that you are. And, uh, you know, a study like this is really starting to set a, set a trend that's showing nitro is very safe. It's a very effective medication for CHF. Um, you should probably toss out the, the sublingual for the most part. And if your patient really needs nitroglycerin, this is somebody that you should get the pump on. Mm -hmm. um, and you know what? You can even do a push dose. And there's studies, I and mean, we didn't look them up here, but we can find them. There's studies that show that even giving push dose, like you can give up to a gram of nitroglycerin mm -hmm. and there's no adverse outcomes from that. And I, I remember when, when push dose became really popular, um, or I guess when it, when it was a newer thing, yeah, it, it was, was very real, popular in was, the literature. I, I remember conversations where they're like, oh, well, you know, you're going to give too much. We're like... I'm already giving 400 micrograms in a tablet. Right. If I give 100 micrograms IV, I, like yeah. it, it feels like, you know, and, and not to get into like the bioavailability conversation, right. but you know, the thing is like, oh, well, giving 150 micrograms of nitroglycerin IV, that's so much. Oh yeah. I remember, like, like I giving, remember bringing, ner bringing people into the hospital when we started doing yeah. that and being aggressive and nurses would lose their minds. Yeah. What do you mean? It's 160 micrograms a minute. 
yeah, but look at them. Look how good they're doing. Well, right, exactly. Like, you know, like well, it, <laughs> their it, pressure's it, down. They're not sweating. They're well, breathing. And that's, that's the funny thing where it's like, oh, well, you could bottom out their pressure. Like, right, but it's not. Like, I'm looking, I'm looking <laughs> it's right at the patient. Um, but so I, I, you know, just to take a couple minutes to talk about it, because I, I, I feel like a lot of times in our, you know, our education, our, our FOMED community and all that stuff, we spend a lot of time talking about the sexy stuff, mm -hmm. you know, which yeah, sure. incidentally, we're going to talk about sucks versus Rockeronium in a minute. So here we go. Um, but you know, we talk about like, oh, like here's a new RSI thing. Here's a new, you know, a, a sexy yeah. new trauma thing. Um, you know, like tea pods are coming back and, yeah, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And I feel like sometimes we get away from the data of like the meat and potatoes kind of stuff that we see sure. every single day. Sure. You know, if a study came out that said like, you know, there, here's a better way to apply a tourniquet and start an IV, I'm certain no one would read it. And, you know, they may not. And, and that's, <laughs> and so, you know, going over stuff like this, we're like, this is a patient that you're going to see all the time every day. And it's the winter time now. Like, sure. You know, you're going to see those CHF patients who have had trouble breathing, who, you know, didn't want to move or didn't want to go outside in the cold mm -hmm. or worse decided that today's the day I'm going to shuffle my sidewalk for the first time in 15 yeah. years. And then they end up flashing over and, you know, now yeah. it turns out and you can give them nitroglycerin and they'll be just sick fine. And you can, you can go ahead and hammer them with this medication and they will get better. Yeah. So nitroglycerin, again, <clears throat> treat your patients, but it, it appears that it's pretty safe uh, in the setting of acute pulmonary edema and congestive heart failure. Go for it. So now let's move on to another study that came out from Ramsey et al. This is in pre-hospital emergency care as well. And this was discussing uh, succinylcholine versus rocuronium. This came out of the University of Washington. This was Seattle's Medic One program. Um, really high speed program. I, yeah, there's a, it's, they are the, they're the standard bearer, you know. I, I think so. The they're one, they're one of them. They've got yeah. to be. Um, really interesting infographic that was put out that'll be attached here and, uh, I, I, I feel the infographic was a little bit misleading, but we'll get into some of the data. So essentially what they did was they looked at patients who were candidates for RSI between July 2015 and June of 2022, which very, very long time, which the funny part about over that seven year period, their N was only 1,475 patients. Um, Interesting. And there, there, was a, there was exclusion criteria. The initial recruitment, I think, was something like 5,000 and change. Right. Um, uh, they, and they they, 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 they they kind of strained out some of yeah they whittled some of them down I, yeah. I think some of them were cardiac arrests and whatever so right. but what they looked at were uh, alive and viable patients who could receive RSI and you know they they used standard protocols with succinylcholine and rocuronium kind of side to side um, you know without getting into too many of the specifics about how data is done you know I, I don't this wasn't really a blinded thing it was more just we, we're going to look back and see who got what and what their outcomes. Were. No, it really wasn't a randomized control trial uh, yeah. where, you know, you're, you're giving, you know, you're giving one or the other. You don't know. They don't know. Yeah. It, it wasn't, it, it wasn't specified that's, like that. It, it's it was, not like that. Um, but again, the methods not with not, notwithstanding, um, you were interested in the results of the studies. And again, this was sucks versus rock. It was pretty much a heads up comparison. Um, Overall, they found that the use of RSI came with better cormac lehane scores. Um, SUX was a little bit faster to achieve paralysis, which shouldn't be surprising. We know that succinylcholine paralyzes people faster than rocuronium. Right. Um, and then their first pass success rate was 84% for succinylcholine, 83% for rocuronium. And hypoxemia was 25% in the SUX group and 23% in the rock group. So I think there's a couple ways to look at this where... You know, and it's it's a good data set. I'm I, I'm I was happy reading it. Um, I I think that this is kind of starting to argue that it doesn't really matter practically which paralytic you use in our side. Yeah, I agree. I think what we've turned into is you know the rock rock sucks sucks thing uh, that the FOMED community loves to get into. <laughs> Stop I mean... doing bumper sticker medicine. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the outcomes you got to take from this study. Um, it doesn't statistically matter a huge difference which one you use. What matters is are you an experience, are you a good clinician that's using this effectively? Do you know your stuff? Are you doing your pre-oxygenation? That's much more important than what agent you're choosing for uh you know, to, to induce paralysis. Yeah. Um, pretty much the same of, it's the same thing we're finding out where, you know, um, 
if you compare, well, some people are like, oh, Atomidate is great and I use it for everything. And then other people are Camp Ketamine and they'll, they'll, they'll hold that flag until they die. We should, we should make that a shirt. Camp Again, Ketamine. I think in the vast majority of these cases, what the studies are starting to show, it doesn't matter. What, what right. matters? First pass success. No hypoxia, no hypotension, or as limited as possible. Those are the people that survive this procedure and do well with this procedure. Right. And I think that's what we need to start taking away from these studies. Uh, again, this is a very proficient program. This is a very, very good program that does a lot of advanced stuff. Uh, they have excellent medical oversight, excellent QA per, uh, process. This, it, for, for those that are uninitiated, Seattle's Medic One program, uh, their students go through the Michael Kopas paramedic training program, and Michael Kopas essentially invented EMS in the modern age. Like that's Yeah, he's one, he's one that, of the uh, you know, it's, it, um, it would be like going to the Wayne Gretzky hockey academy. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is. And it, it's, you know, it shows that with experienced providers, that are that are doing the procedure well, right? I don't know that it matters what you're using. So I, I think that's kind of the interesting conversation that this study lends to, where you know your first pass success is 84, 83 percent. Your hypoxemia. And I'm surprised is, about that. I would think yeah. for them they'd be a little higher. But and, 85, well, and, 85 percent is not a bad. One of the number. things that they that they mention is in the paper is each medic in the system has at least ten intubations a year. That's, which is, that's important. Which is a it, it is above the national average because the national average is around one or two. Um, yeah, I'd it, have to, we'd have to look it up. I think it's yeah, definitely I, less than six. Yeah, and I, as New Jersey medics, uh, you know, we we intubate everybody <laughs> um, by comparison. So it, you know, you, you also want to get a decent amount of tries or or intubation attempts in that study. Mm -hmm. um, something that isn't really elucidated too much is how many attempts that they had or what the provider experience level was. So there's always going to be variables. Was it VL right? or DL? Yeah. So, um, but the thing that kind of stuck out to me, aside from that, it doesn't seem to matter which drug we use, is your first pass success is 84 to 83%. I know that each shop wants their metrics to be 90% or above. You really want it to be 100%, but obviously you're never going to get 100% of anything. But... I think that the 84 and 83 percent was very interesting. I'd like to know what were the variables in those settings. You know, were yeah. they were they like in a closed environment? Was intubation not possible? Like, were they in a van? You know, were, were yeah. they were they in? A, were, you know, was the was the treatment done in the back of a type two ambulance or a type three? And I think there's too many variables to really kind of answer those questions. Yeah, but, I don't know. If we're going to be able to find the yeah, find but but again, out. even if we're not able to find it, then you know going into any potential RSI scenario that 15% of the time, you might not be able to get a first pass. And you also know that a fourth of the time, one out of every four patients are gonna become hypoxemic, which is another issue where we know that hypoxemia in RSI can be associated with poor outcomes. That, was the, other data, that, that was the other data point that really shocked me, especially with this program being as good as they are yep. or as highly regarded as they are. The, the rates of hypoxia, I mean, one in four, that's, we're still not there yet. And this is, and again, this isn't a criticism of the Medic One system. Like, not you, at you, all. you guys are great. Please keep listening. <laughs> um, it, it's we have one, arguably one of the the best, mo at least most proficient systems in the United States, and still a quarter of their patients are hypoxic. What that says to me is, okay, now there's however many other systems. What are their hypoxic rates rates in RSI? Uh, it's got to be higher. You know, so. And it, it, again, this is another thing that tends to support what we've been talking about and what the data has been talking about for, I mean, a decade now, where it's what saves lives and what makes people better right. is oxygen and circulation. Mm -hmm. That just the end. So if you're RSIing somebody, you got to make sure you keep them oxygenated. Whether And honestly, I don't even care how you do it. I don't. I don't care if it's a high flow nasal cannula, if you use a BVM and just try it, just keep them oxygenated somehow the, as best as you can. This is where you want that sat at 100. Yeah. Where, yeah you I, want, I you rather, want their part, you want their, their PAO2 to be high. Absolutely. I would rather, in an RSI scenario, I'd rather someone be transiently over oxygenated so that when they, when they wash out, you know, the rest of the oxygen in their lungs, there's some reserve and that I'm displacing all that nitrogen that's sitting in their body. Absolutely. Like I, you know, and without getting too, like wonky and in the weeds about it. Like in RSI, the things that kills people are hypoxia and hypotension. We know that. We know that. So that, and like that, again, that's extant. That's been elucidated. So all we, all, all we have to do 
is temporize their blood pressure and their oxygenation. Listen, flood them with oxygen and have your epi push dose or your presser uh, yeah, ready whatever, to go. Whatever you get, whether it's epi, phenylephrine, you know, neo, uh, whatever. Again, matter. here we go again with know. one agent better than the other, maybe in a specific case. Overall, just use it. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, just use something. Is your patient's blood pressure too low? Make it higher. I, I read, I actually read something that, um, I actually read something and I, I wish I remember where it was from that somebody was advocating for starting a low dose epinephrine infusion on your RSI patients. I, like, so I've heard, I've heard that idea pitched um, and it doesn't sound crazy to me. No, I, and I don't know. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to name drop, um, even though I don't, I don't really, I'm not positive who said it, but it, it, it was, it might've been Slovis or Antavi. Um, it might've been, it might've been Malamet was Maybe. what we're talking about in, and cause again, we'll the, try to the, find it for the show notes. Yeah. We'll, we'll add it in. Um, but again, like it's the basis of, we have no idea what the hell we're doing. So, you know, it, I, we, I, we I don't want to say that. I want to say we're evolving. We're sure, constantly fine, yeah. evolving and, and I, we're yes, never, right. we're never going to find the, except in certain instances like nitroglycerin, a definitive answer is always going to be elusive because things change. Yes. Okay. That's fair. You know, I, and, I, and I and I think that's what I, it. Is. I think that's what we're on the cusp of. So I, I say that I guess more out of frustration because it, it it feels like data comes out and we're like, okay, we know how this works, and then we almost work to refute the data, mm -hmm. which I, I I understand is you know like that's the scientific method, but we we take the data and we're like, well, my anecdote suggests that this doesn't work. Yeah, you know I can, I mean? see, that, I can that's, see that. That's always problematic for me. But anyway, yeah. So it, it, when you have these patients, if you're not really sure what's going on with them and you're worried about temporizing their blood pressure or their oxygenation, temporize their blood pressure or their oxygenation, especially if you have push dose pressor, pressors available. Right. And if you don't have push dose pressors available, that's where you have to have a really good checklist of what you're going to do pre-procedure. I'm going right? to go a step further. I think if you're not, if you're doing advanced airway that's medication facilitated, uh, and you're not using push dose pressures or pressor infusions in your practice for that airway. I don't think you should be don't doing do it. it. Yeah, I, and I, I agree. I'm I'm thinking of a situation I think the stakes where, are too high. Yeah, I, I I can only think of the situation where you know you're out of meds or whatever, like busy shift type of stuff. Right, right. Um, where really, you know, but again, if you're in a situation and even if you don't carry paralytics, I mean, delayed sequence intubation has shown a lot of really good success. We don't have the data on it. Um, but I mean, yeah, I, I stand ketamine. We are, we are a ketamine family here. Um, and I think that, you know, in most scenarios, you can probably just- It's close to perfect. It. I think, <laughs> I think right now we're not, it's not a hundred percent perfect, but no, it, is, nothing is. it is close to the holy grail of medicine. It's getting what we're going to get. Good old, good old vitamin K. <laughs> All right. All right. Moving on. So now let's get into a, uh, a news story. This, uh, this started in 2019. Um, where a, a gentleman named Elijah McLean was, um, I, well, Elijah McLean was killed. Uh, how you want to classify his death uh, seems to be a subject of debate, but it seems to be the facts of the case are Elijah McLean was being restrained by the police and he was, the paramedics on scene were instructed by the police officers to give him what ended up being a potentially fatal dose of ketamine. Um, we talked about this on the show in 2019 and, you know. Yeah, we, a, we yeah. Absolutely. We, and as I said, we, we stand ketamine here, but ketamine is a drug that is to be used the way it's, in, it's intended. Uh, it's not supposed to be used as a chemical restraint. And that's what happened here. So um, this Elijah McLean was given ketamine. He was prone on a stretcher and he ended up dying. Right. Um, and the, and the, the, the earthquake of this situation is that the practitioners were actually charged yeah. with homicide. Um, based on Elijah McLean dying in their presence. Right. And they pointed out some things that they didn't, that the clinicians didn't do or failed to do that contributed to his death. Right. And that, that's kind of the biggest thing is in most of these cases, and you know, we're not, we're not going to dive into the whole, uh, the, the issues that the, the unpleasantness of, uh, uh, the past decade. Yeah, there's plenty uh, in, of interpretations in on both sides out there. It's not uh, this. This case is really a bellwether. Um, it really sent shockwaves through the EMS community uh, and led us to question a lot of things um, 
it led us to debunk the whole idea of excited delirium, which is now completely disappeared right. from things or is disappearing. And it should, because and it, it was a, it was a syndrome with no scientific evidence behind yeah. it whatsoever. So the excited delirium thing, it, it turned out to be a definition that was essentially one of convenience for the police. Um, it was only ever kind of delineated in the American College of Emergency Positions and the British College of Emergency Positions um, in their in their literature discussing how uh, you know these types of what they were claiming were mental illnesses kind of present. Uh, and there's even bias all over yeah. the definition because the doctor that studied and did the, the initial studies on excited delirium had a stake in taser manufa yeah. man yes. manufacturing. He, <laughs> uh, he had a stake in the business and he was they were marketing tasers as a way to protect right. officers from as, excited as delirium less cases lethal. as less than lethal. Uh, so there's bias, there was bias all over this. People jumped on the bandwagon about this, this ability of somebody in an altered state to have superhuman strength, to be a complete threat to everybody around them. And the only thing we could do is tranquilize them with ketamine and a humongous dose of ketamine. Um, the, the term that was bandied about was a heroic dose, um, <laughs> which I, I think is a phenomenal term. I, <laughs> I, I, take a, I take a heroic dose of everything. Um, but I mean, the, the dose that he received was, was close to 500 milligrams, which is not necessarily an uncommon dose. And it, again, this isn't a, this isn't something that's as simple as, you know, A caused B. It was, you had this patient who already had a narrow uh, left, cor left coronary artery, which was found in his autopsy. And then on top of that, he's also in an excited state because of the attack. He also received ketamine and he also was. Prone, yeah, this is a total also, Swiss cheese. And he also, yeah. This is a total Swiss cheese model of failure. It's exactly <laughs> it literally every hole got touched. Yeah. And the result was this man died. And to be honest, he didn't have to. And that's the key point we need to take away from this. Yes. Um, there, we could go on for three hours about this case, but the reality of this is that it's causing us to rethink how we treat patients in the field, how EMS has to uh, work with law enforcement, right? And how we define altered mental status and how we deal with potentially violent subjects. But I also think culturally, there's there's something to comment on as well, where you know, I think for a long time, we had always, A, assumed that, you know, we're all on the same team mm. and B, that, you know, we're, we're there to help the police and, and do, you know, and we're not. assist. <laughs> and I, again, I, I think that that's where we want to be, but I don't know that that's operationally where we are, where again, where they, we need to be as patient advocates. 100%. And completely neutral and impartial. Right. Um, and this is where uh, clinicians, EMS gets in trouble. Uh, you know, that mentality leads to bad decision making. Mm -hmm. You know, you get on a scene, um, this guy's hopped up, the, the, the cops are all hopped up on adrenaline. They're telling you to do something. You're working it through your mind. It's a stressful situation. You're like, yeah, it seems reasonable. Stop. Take, you, so I, that's got to stop. I almost wonder how much of it, and, and I'm not, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, to assign blame, but I wonder how much of it is, you know, you're taught to trust in, in what the police want to do. And thus you, you do what the police tell you to do and how much of in, in those scenarios. And again, without knowing the people that were on the call, um, how much pressure was applied on EMS by the police to be compliant to what the police department wanted. I think if you got a room full of sociologists in here, none of them would agree. Probably not. Well, and, but again, you know, this, this is a scenario. And I, I think that there's going to be an argument among a lot of people that like, this is something that happens all the time. This is just one bad incident. And that may be, what, may be the case, but there's now a couple paramedics that are facing, you know, murder charges. Yeah. They're going to go to, they're going to go to prison. Or, if they like, get convicted, this, they, this is they not lost their licenses. Thing. And it is a, um, it's a groundbreaking thing where up until very recently, EMS was kind of, you're kind of allowed to do stuff. And, you know, I, and again, this is not a debate of like, they're not letting us do anything anymore. 
but it's, let's be honest, we lived in a gray area for a long oh, yeah, time. Yeah, and but it's got to change. And now it's turning into more of a scenario where you know there's an expected outcome. If you're going to give someone you know whatever a gram of ketamine and then prone them, you're responsible for the treatment that you gave. Yeah. So I think that again, it, it's a it's a patient advocacy thing, but it's also sort of a self advocacy thing, where you have someone who's like, I need you to do this. Be like, absolutely not. That's inappropriate for the patient. It's also inappropriate for me and my clinical practice. Like, it's just not what I do. You know, Listen, I, the important thing to take away from this, and I don't care what your scope of practice, your license level is, is first and foremost, you have to protect you, yourself. Yeah. You have to realize that you will be held responsible for your actions. Absolutely. And that's the thing is, you know, and you're taught through school, you know, like you're, even like when you're taught, silly documentation things like how often are we told going through emt and medic school that what you write is what happened and thus what you chart has to be you know accurate down to the second mm -hmm. right and i feel like we're all kind of taught that and then you go out into the field and you're like oh, there's a little bit of leeway and you can kind of do it this way 16 like, respirations like i've been on shootings where like the instruction was like just put in your documentation that there was a, like a, you know, a, a puncture wound or a penetrating injury so that I didn't say like there was a bullet in this person's body, you know? So I, I think that as a, as a group, as a culture, we kind of have to grow past where we are. Which is funny. And people be like that on the, about their charts. Right. Okay. But there's people out there that think there's nothing wrong with loading a syringe full of ketamine and jamming it into somebody's thigh right. with no, no thought about what happens next or what the, the consequences could be. Well, see, they, it's because they do that in the movies. <laughs> <laughs> All yeah. right, moving on. So uh, there's a paramedic in Louisiana who's, who's been acting like a real silly goose. Oh, and now we come to our what the actual <laughs> part of the uh, the uh, podcast episode, which is always my favorite. Tell us about tell us about this paramedic. So my, my favorite thing about the, the note on our rundown is my, my my line says paramedic impersonates doctor in Louisiana and the follow-up is it's exactly what it sounds like. Yep. So uh oh Louisiana. So where do we where do we begin? So the, the state of Louisiana, uh home to some of our more popular in media EMS providers, um, they were not involved in this case. No. Uh I know Rollins. <laughs> yeah, what's up, Nola? Uh this actually this actually happened with Acadia Ambulance. Um they have a paramedic who is uh, facing a three count indictment for computer fraud, forgery, and illegal transfer of monetary funds because he used the identity of his college roommate to prescribe medications from 2019 19. to 2022. And he also told people he was a flight physician. Uh, it gets worse. Yeah. It he, he not only bought his own lab coat that says MD on it, but somehow he was able to convince two hospitals in Louisiana that he was a resident physician and got access cards and was actually seeing patients as a physician, which he wasn't. And he was prescribing medications and doing just a, just a whole bunch of wacky stuff you can't do when you're not a doctor. Um, so he's been caught. Uh, and it, it turns out that the, the doctor in question, um, whose identity was effectively stolen by this guy is, is pursuing a lawsuit. Um, but, uh, yeah, so this was, this was a medic who went through medic school and, uh, and again, I'm sure all the information is not publicly available. The story that we got is through the AP. Um, but it, it essentially comes down to this, this guy just went around for three or four years as a medic and was like, no, I'm a doctor. I'm, I'm a no, doctor and too. And no one questioned him. Yeah, no one. No, he was. I, he he kept saying was like the the flight physician thing is what is what really I, stuck with me. I was stunned you know, when like, I heard that Acadian actually had him on a social media post. Oh yeah, that was another uh, thing. Yeah. As a flight physician, yep. and nobody apparently checked to see if so, he actually and this is, was a physician or could fly. And it, <laughs> this is another story where you know hindsight's always twenty twenty. But you see, like, yeah, not only did he work for the ambulance company uh, regularly, but he also was in PR material. He, like, he was a, he was, he was a popular yeah, the, guy. The, it, I, it's an interesting case in that how did this happen? I, I you well, know, it's, it's that Swiss cheese model. Like, how, so, and, and I feel like if you watch, like, conspiracy movies, and I, I don't mean, like, Alex Jones conspiracy films. I mean, like, no, no. you know, like, Catch Me If You Can and, right. and those kind of things where you don't realize how easy it is 
like to defraud people. Oh, absolutely. Until like you show, you're like, right. Oh, like, and I, I'm I, sure, I'm sure that's exactly what he did with his agency. I'm not, problem, I'm not yeah. saying it's their fault at all. No, no. Uh, I'm saying that but they probably could have. They probably maybe, should. There's probably some stuff they should have noticed, but you know. but you know, we'll 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 leave that for the yeah, uh, the civil suit. That's, that's for the courts to decide. That's for the courts. Uh, <laughs> but it's just insane to me that this guy just basically decided I'm going to be a doctor. <laughs> but, like, had I known it was that easy, I, right? I, I would have spent all that time in Antigua, man. I yeah, have, I could have just thrown up. But it, it's. Why take the MCAT? Right, exactly. No, yeah. Why, why take organic why chemistry? Take the, exactly. I could. You mean I didn't have to take all those chemistry courses? I mean, I could. I could just give out Z packs. It's yeah, right? fine, right? But it's interesting to me. Like, first, first the idea of being like, guess what I'm going to do, and then someone else being like, dude, you, you like not you shouldn't do that. You can't do that. And you know, he was like, you watch me, watch yeah. you watch me make that happen, and then. Like it, in theory, there had to have been someone like at Acadia or whoever else was like, Hey, don't we have a medic who works with us with the same name? Like it's, wow. I, that's I, cool. Wow. That's, that's a, what a, a crazy coincidence. coincidence. Um, and again, I, I fully appreciate that hindsight is 2020, but it, it, it feels like this was, or could a, you imagine being the medic that worked with him on like a know, Monday right? and you go into a hospital on a Friday and he's there. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Hey, like, Dr. Steve, you're like, Wait, wait. Well, where Since he when? <laughs> Who's this guy? But no, I, 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 I'm interested to see what the the outcome of that this is. came out of EMS One dot com. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a really, it's almost a story for the movies. Um, it's, it, it's like Doogie Hauser meets like what was it? It's, um, what, it was Wolf like, of Wall it, Street. Is it, is it the good? <laughs> is it the Good Doctor? The film where the the guy is he was a New Jersey guy. The guy who was like killing people in his sleep. Oh, that was the nurse. I was a nurse. Yeah, that was that was right Charles right. Cullen. That was yeah, uh, yeah. that was a nurse. Um, and this has been a there's a there's been a book on it. There's tons of stuff if you Google it. Um, Charles Cullen was a nurse at multiple hospitals in New Jersey and the surrounding area. Uh, he was killing patients, uh, doing mercy killings, and just kept getting moved from hospital mm -hmm. to hospital as people kind of were like, "Well, we're not really thrilled with this guy. We're just gonna let." So th this was when, uh, like, physician-assisted suicide was a very popular topic, and this that's what this man was participating in. And every hospital, everyone was like, what if we just, how about you stop and we'll just move you next door? Which, it's interesting. I didn't know the hospital systems ran like the Catholic Church. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great. Now we're going to get sued by the hospital systems and the Catholic Church. Yay. Bring it on. <laughs> All right, everybody, thank you so much for listening all throughout 2023. Um, in 2024, we have a lot of really exciting stuff coming up. You can see we're in our studio filming this episode. Um, subscribe to us on YouTube and all wherever you get all your podcasts and keep an eye out for all of our stuff. Um, we got a lot of stuff coming up. Um, excited to hear your 2023 stories. Let us know the wackiest stuff that you saw or you know, if you had an interesting patient or an interesting case. Um, yeah, please anonymize it. We don't. Yeah, we, are, we, we don't. I'm, I'm not going to be up here like John Doe said. Um, but yeah, just let us know what you guys think. We're excited to talk to you in 2024. And for the overrun, I'm Ed Bowder. Yeah, I'm Dan Schwester. We'll talk to you next year. Take care.